So, metaphysics after Darwin, that there are different ways in which philosophy and science interact. Uh, I don't think that um, the idea that philosophy is science is going to play much of a role in what follows, but all of these different kinds of interaction will play a role. So philosophy can influence science, it can overlap with science, it can organize science, uh, it can attempt to provide foundations for science, it does all of these things more or less successfully. Uh, and the theses that I will be wanting to defend today are that scientists are always realists. There is no avoiding it. If you're a scientist, then you're a realist. This is meant to be a trivial proposition. Um, the second thesis is that metaphysics of a broadly Aristotelian sort has been interacting with science from the very beginning and still interacts with science in uh, the above-mentioned ways today. And then finally, this is happening especially in the field of biology, which is undergoing a golden age of classification in, again, broadly the Aristotelian sense. Now, this is a, uh, intended to be a somewhat provocative thesis. Um, there are, as you all know, a lot of people who argue that in the age of Darwin, we're no longer allowed to believe in Aristotelian categories because Darwin showed that everything is flux and there is a huge amount of re rhetoric defending theses along those lines. Here is just one example from Dewey, uh, typical rhetoric. In laying hands upon the sacred ark of absolute permanent permanency, that's meant to be an insult. Uh, in treating the forms that had been regarded as types of fixity, the origin of species introduced a mode of thinking that, in the end, was bound to transform, and so on. And then another example, uh, this gentleman will play, play a role in the, in the uh, uh, later part of the talk. Um, Horace M. Callen says, when science is viewed from the Greek point of view, the subject of research had to be seen as eternal and immutable, as forms and so on existing eternally in their Aristotelian classifications. Darwin's theory, however, with its principles of spontaneous generation, I don't know that Darwin ever had a theory of spontaneous generation, and the survival of the fit dealt a death blow to scientific Hellenism. So both of these uh, come from around 1909, 1910. Everything is flux. So I'm going to show that that is not uh, coherent. That kind of rhetoric is not coherent when we look at the way biological science is working. Now I'm going to now to give an example of spawning. So I'm not going to talk about Wundt who, uh, as we all know, founded the first laboratory of experimental psychology. I'm going to be talking about the Austrian contribution to the spawning of psychology from philosophy. And in 1874, Brentano published a psychology from an empirical standpoint. And Brentano's students, in a, a very impressive way, then spread the message of Brentano that we can have an empirical science of psychology, which is at the same time a philosophically coherent science of psychology, and they applied this message in different ways, forming schools, for instance, the Berlin School of Gestalt Psychology, the Polish school founded by Twardowski, which we'll talk about a little bit later, the Meinong School, which then spread to Trieste, and from there to uh, Croatia, Slovenia, so that there was an organization of um, scientific interactions between followers of Brentano, developing Brentano's ideas. Roughly speaking, along the lines of starting with psychology, studying the psychological theories of meaning and intentionality, and spreading outwards from there to theories of language and logic. And moving off to Berlin. And I, I did quite a lot of work early on trying to track these various influences. I think there is a lot more to be said about a lot of those influences from what we've learned since then. But you can see already that there is a lot of 
uh, psychological work, a lot of very interesting psychological work flowing from what Brentano succeeded in doing through his students um, in Vienna and then in other parts of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and then ever wider. Now, Germany, um, I don't want to talk about uh, but I will just mention one thing which will be relevant to the main argument here. Germany lacked scientific organization. Now, what Stumpf meant had to be a little bit more than that. What Stumpf meant, I think, was that Germany lacked scientific organization of a philosophical sort. So what he says here is German idealism failed because it was lacking scientific organization. So he saw the scientific organization of the Brentano movement as having succeeded where Germany failed. Why did Germany fail? Because everybody was obsessed, not with Goethe, but with Kant. Everything was either pro or against Kant. Philosophy became fixated on a single personality, and this set fundamental barriers to division of labor, mutual criticism and correction, uh, mutual recognition and gave rise to a kind of dogmatic in intolerance. This habitus is alien to science, which rests on the principle of cooperation. Now, Stumpf um, published in 1907 a work on the partitioning of the sciences. And... Uh, this is, uh, the, this is a copy from the Harvard University Library owned by Henry Scheffer, uh, which is now on Google Books. And this is the table of contents, which you can't read. This is an ontology uh, of entities, which is derived from Stumpf's Einteilung der Wissenschaften. So we see there are three main kinds of entities, physical, mental, and neutral. I'm, I still don't quite understand what a neutral entity is, but his examples are Phenomenological entities, which I presume means something like sense data. Ideological entities, which would be ideas. And general relations, and then the general relations are the objects of epistemology and so forth. And then there is another dimension to Stumpf's Einteilung, which is between sciences of the general and sciences of the particular. So history is a science of the particular, a Wissenschaft. Um, mathematics is a science of the general and one question which immediately arises which we will be uh, coming to later on is biology a science of the general or a science of the particular and for Stumpf it's ranked along with all the natural sciences as a science of the particular now I'm going to uh, take a different view on these matters as will become clear later on so I think that all sciences are sciences of the general there is no science of Bill Clinton because science is not interested in the particular. It's interested in general laws. And it, from that point of view, we have to see sciences as being such that they capture the particular because they capture general laws. So history is not a science from this point of view because history doesn't have laws. It doesn't have general entities. But we'll come back to that dichotomy later. Now, Brentano, Brentano, as I already said, spawned not only a lot of interesting scientific work in psychology, Brentano's students also spawned formal semantics. Um, as I think everyone in the room knows, Balzano influenced some of Brentano's students in ways which Brentano himself was not uh, very happy with, uh, and uh, partly as a result of the influence of Bolzano, primarily as a result of the influence of Twardowski, who was very keen to develop a scientific philosophy in Poland in the spirit of Brentano, Twardowski's students in, in what, was, what came to be called the Lemberg-Warsaw or Lwów-Warsaw School, which included in the next generation, people like Tarski developed what we know today as formal semantics. Along the way, Lezhnevsky developed formal Mariology, which will play a role. 
down the road. So, these are the principal theses. Scientists are realists. Realist metaphysics is interacting with science. Always did, always will. And biology, in particular today, has experienced a golden age of Aristotelian classification. So, part two is about biology. Now, when we talk about biology, we're talking about the modern synthesis, which was initiated by Mendel, who showed how we can explain how Darwin's theory of evolution actually operates. And the um, culmination of work on Mendel's discoveries is the Human Genome Project, which was concluded in 2001. Nowadays, we have not just the Human Genome Project, we have genomes for hundreds of other species. Uh, we have genomes for aeroplanes and shoes, because there are lots of organisms inside shoes. And you can, you can decode the genomes of your shoes. Or anyway, the interior. I, I said enough about shoes. So, before Darwin, people were carrying out experiments on animals. Uh, they, 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 for Aristotle, this was a matter of curiosity. For Galen, it was a way of um, advancing knowledge of anatomy. So Galen already intuited there was a for, for Auserschauen on Galen's part of the, the way in which understanding the anatomy of mammals could give us clues about the anatomy of human beings. And then Avanzoa was carrying out experiments on animals to test surgical procedures. But in fact, none of these people had any reason to believe that studying animals could throw light on human beings. It was Darwin. That, that was Dar what Darwin taught us. Darwin taught us that we can learn about human organisms from experiments on other organisms. Why? Because, well, Darwin didn't know this. Now we know it because we share huge, proportion, huge fractions of our genomes with other organisms, including with yeast. So we can carry out experiments on yeast in order to learn more about human aging processes, for instance. And we can do that because we share large parts of our genome with the genome of yeast. So biology today is biology based on the, on the results of decoding the genomes of different organisms. Now, before then, biology looked like this. It was, it was understandable to human beings. Human beings could understand how cells divide. They could understand how people, for instance, become infected. Now, the data of biology looks like this. How do you do biology with data like this? How do you understand infection if this is what you are working with? Well, the answer is that you have to find a way of linking the two kinds of data. You have to find a way of linking old biology with new biology. So you have to link phenomena like this with data like this. That's a challenge. That is what makes modern biology possible, creating that link, linkage. And the way you do that is to create a controlled vocabulary. This will consist of terms from biology, perfectly ordinary terms like infection or death or cell division, terms which will be used across organisms, not just for human beings, but for other organisms too. And you will provide definitions for the terms in your controlled vocabulary of a logical sort so that the computer can reason with those terms. And the result is then called an ontology. And then you will use the ontology to annotate the data in your databases. So you will go through a gene array and you will see that this particular sequence or segment of data is associated with, associated with sphingolipid transporter activity. 
which is a term in your controlled vocabulary. And then you will be able to find all the examples of segments of genomes which are associated with sphingolipid transporter activity and which have been annotated by other biologists who are using the same controlled vocabulary. So, the problem biologists face is that they have huge amounts of data. They then publish papers about this data using words, but they use different words. They don't use a controlled vocabulary typically. And so the data is described in heterogeneous ways, and so it doesn't accumulate. You don't have the, the necessary kind of organization amongst different scientists. For instance, mouse biologists and biologists working on aging in yeast cells. But you need to find all the data that you need in a uniform way. And so you create a control vocabulary, you describe the data using the preferred labels in the control vocabulary, which will come with logical definitions, and thereby you semantically enhance the data nowadays with uh, universal resource identifiers, so web addresses. And the most successful of these control vocabularies is called the gene ontology. And the gene ontology is organized as a graph. It's an acyclical graph with the nodes being the labels with their definitions and the edges being simple relations. For instance, is a subkind of. So M phase is a part of cell cycle. Cell cycle is a kind of cellular physiological process. A cellular physiological process is a kind of cellular process, and a cellular process is a kind of biological process. There is something like 40,000 nodes in the graph. And then this graph is used to annotate huge amounts of data so that you can use it to link data, to find your way around data, to reason with data. And this has become a standard tool for clinical and biological research. So the PubMed uh, Medline database is a database with, I don't know, millions of scientific articles about clinical or biological phenomena. And the number of abstracts in PubMed which mention ontology is rising, as you can see. So ontology is an ever more useful tool a biological research. But when we examine those occurrences of the word ontology, then nearly all of them today are examples of just one ontology, the gene ontology. So the gene ontology has been amazingly successful. And it's, it produces a, a way to access the data that you need for your research. So this is one of the gene ontology browsers. We have here a gene ontology term, cardiac muscle development. So many organisms have cardiac muscles which develop in the neonatal, uh, the prenatal stage. And we want to search for cardiac muscle development proteins. Which are the proteins involved in cardiac muscle development? Well, we go to the Amigo browser, we enter cardiac muscle development, we tell it we want to know human proteins associated with cardiac muscle development, and it will give us a list of all those proteins. Um, there are, I don't know, um, typically hundreds of proteins. So maybe we want to understand um, Arabidopsis thaliana. There are 30,321 gene ontology annotations to proteins in organisms of this particular species which are involved in corresponding biological phenomena recorded in the gene ontology. And there are hundreds of species which are searchable. In other words, we can cross the bridge from old biology data to new biology data using the Go browser. Something like $150 million have been invested so far in the gene ontology. And there are something like 200 million annotations relating gene products described in the main protein and other databases in biology 
And the, these resources are growing constantly. 52,000 scientific journal articles have been manually annotated by Go experts. And all of this is allowing new kinds of biological research that had never been anticipated, not even by the creators of the Go. And the, the main paper on the Go is entitled Gene Ontology, Tool for the Unification of Biology. Now, that phrase, unification of biology, is going to be uh, very important in just a minute. So the Go provides a multi-species tagging system which tags biology data in a species-neutral way that allows people not merely to find data but also to contribute to the data so that science accumulates. If we didn't have the Go, there would be less accumulation of scientific results, there would be less discoverability of scientific results, and there would be less comparability of scientific results. And in this respect, the GO is like the international system of units. So just as the standardization of meters, kilograms, and seconds allowed comparability of quantitative results, so the GO allows comparability of qualitative results in biological experimentation. And the international system of units doesn't merely standardize units, it also standardizes terminology. So even Chinese, even Russians have to use the same symbols for measurement units that we use, which is a great achievement if you think about it. The, it allows logical definitions of derived units from a small set of base units. And it contributes to the interoperation of different science, sciences, not merely of different labs in the same discipline, but also of scientists working in different disciplines. And it thereby contributes to the orchestration of scientists' activities. So they work together without having to do anything in order to work together, just because they're using a common system of units. And it contributes to the cumulativity of results. Now, people talk about unified science uh, also in philosophy. But as we know, they talk uh, in the Vienna Circle, for instance, the later Vienna Circle, which we'll come to in a minute, they talk about unified science in terms of a set of propositions. What the gene ontology means by unified science, what the gene ontology means by describing the go as a tool for unified biology is that we have a common terminology for making data comparable and thereby allowing an orchestration of scientists which is analogous to the orchestration created by the international system of units. Now this word orchestration was introduced by Callan, the same rhetorician of flux that we met earlier. And Callan was using it as part of a criticism of Neurath who published in 1946, this response to Callan's criticism called the orchestration of the sciences by the encyclopedism of logical empiricism. Now, Neurath here defends a view which could, could have been used by the gene ontology. He doesn't get it right, of course, but he defends a view which they could have used. So, what he says is, brought up in a Machian tradition, we, that is to say, his friends in the Vienna Circle encyclopedist movement, we tried to pass from chemistry to biology, from mechanics to sociology, without altering the language applied to them. Now, what he meant was that everyone should speak English, or <laughs> rather, everyone should, we, we know that anyway, everyone should speak simple English, of the sort which is to be found in Carnap's protocol sentences. I, Otto, now see red turkey. I, Otto, now remember, I, Otto, saw red turkey one minute ago, that kind of thing. We're not allowed ever to use words like truth or mind or mental because they're metaphysics, which is bad. We're only allowed to use terms of simple English. And if, if we do this right, we'll have a universal jargon, this is his word, 
which could be in English or French or Esperanto. It wouldn't matter because they would all do the same job. Now, the gene ontology is like a universal jargon for biology. Now, the later unified science movement, which, which uh, for different reasons, no longer followed Neurath's approach, didn't care so much about the universal jargon, about the language, the nouns, the noun phrases used by scientists, because they were defending a logical view of unification based on predicate logic. There are no nouns anymore. There are predicates. Um, the unified science movement, both in its early and its later form, faces questions about how we are to understand the relations between scientific disciplines. And it's those questions which the gene ontology, I believe, has led to the solution for, or a solution for. So the Vienna Circle, of course, could not foresee the main reason why biology is so interesting today, which is that scientific theories in biology are not sets of hypotheses and laws. They are primarily gigantic bodies of data, or rather the propositions of the theories are, are meaningful and useful because they are associated with gigantic bodies of data which can be reasoned with only computationally. So biology is part of information-driven science. And the problem of the unity of science is a problem of categorizing data. It's a problem of consistent description of data. It's not a problem of using a single system of logic with a single set of axioms along the lines that the later Vienna Circle supposed. Okay, so now we have a new orchestration of science. Bolzano had a, an ontology based on Mariology, which is, looks roughly like that. The details are not important for the moment. Bolzano and Brentano then influenced Meinong to produce an ontology of object types. But they influenced Husserl, first of all, to produce a very early formal Mariology of his own, with axioms even, but also to coin the term formal ontology, which he used around 1905. That was formal ontologie, first time that was used. And then Twardowski, or Twardowski school, led to the first logical formalization of Mariology by Lezhnevsky. And then Tarski, as we saw, created formal semantics, in part under the influence of Lezhnevsky, and then in, under the influence of both Tarski and Russell, Joseph Woodger, in 1937, created an amazing book called The Axiomatic Method in Biology, uh, which is, if, if you seek an unreadable book, and that is a, an example. It's just Principia Mathematica applied to biology. And, of course, the biology that Woodger was working with is now completely out of date. It's absolutely useless. But it's fantastic. It's amazing. It's, it's a, of a standard which is higher than most of the work which we have in formal biology, which we will be coming to next. So he was, he was a gener two generations ahead of his time. But it's useless and unreadable. Um, but what Wuja was doing is now being done by many other people. Already in 1905, 1985, Patrick Hayes, who was an artificial intelligence scientist, also a former philosopher, published a paper called The Ontology of Liquids. The idea behind this paper is that if we're going to build a robot um, that can, for instance, buy a salad in a restaurant, then we have to teach the robot what humans know about liquids. And we have to do this in a formal way. How do we do this? Well, we build an ontology of liquids with formal definitions of all the terms. Now, I knew about Patrick Hayes, and I knew about his work on the ontology of liquids. I knew I didn't know about the gene ontology. In 2003, I founded the Institute for Formal Ontology and Medical Information Science. To be honest, I didn't know very much about anything at that stage. But I found it, I just certainly didn't know about medicine.
But I founded this institute. And very quickly, I realized that there was something called a gene ontology. And I looked at it, and I realized it was full of logical mistakes. And so I organized a meeting. I invited the representatives of the gene ontology to come to my institute. And I gave a long talk called STOP, which stands for Smart Terminology Through Ontological Principles. And I went through all the mistakes in the gene ontology, some of which were hilarious. I'm, I'm not going to, re well, I'll repeat one. Menopause is defined, or was defined in that version of the gene ontology as a part of death. <laughs> so as a result of that, I, they, they, they were impressed by my critique and they, they gave me uh, influence power. Now, the gene ontology, as I said, was amazingly successful but only for a relatively narrow set of disciplines. So parts of cells, functions of molecules, and biological processes. They didn't do diseases. They didn't do uh, symptoms. They didn't do anatomy. They didn't do experimental biology. They just did cell parts, molecular functions, and biological processes. They had already started, however, to produce other ontologies which would extend the gene ontology. And this is the orchestration problem. How do we divide sciences? Was ist die Einteilung der Wissenschaften? Der Wissenschaft? They didn't know how to do that. And so partly under my influence, we created something called the Oboe Foundry. And this is now a rather small subset of the Oboe Foundry candidate ontologies. These are ontologies which extends the GO. So the GO here are the, um, the shaded regions. And then we have ontologies for chemistry, ontologies for types of cells rather than just parts of cells. We have ontologies for anatomy. We have ontologies for phenotypes and so forth. And we now have disease ontologies. We have an environment ontology. And... Um, the, the key to this Einteilung der Wissenschaften is something called Basic Formal Ontology, and that's the book that you saw. Um, basic Formal Ontology is the starting point for the creation of further ontologies by, via a process of downward population. You start with Buffo, and then you create progressively more specialized ontologies as you go down. And the the oboe foundry division is based upon the categories in buffer. And I use the word category deliberately. So it goes like this. We have an ontology called the OGMS, the Ontology for General Medical Science, which is an ontology of well, the labels in which are those labels which are used for any clinical encounter, disease, treatment, patient, organism, and so forth. And then we create extensions of OGMs, such as the cardiovascular disease ontology, the genetic disease ontology, the cancer disease ontology, and so forth. The, the, the one example where we are already in a situation where we have a developed ontology for further extension is the infectious disease ontology, which consists of all those labels which apply to all infectious diseases. So infection, pathogen, uh, virulence, uh, and so forth. And then we can create infectious disease ontologies for each pathogen very, very easily. Um, once we've created a Staph aureus ontology, we can create very easily a methicillin-resistant Staph aureus ontology or an Australian methicillin-resistant Staph aureus ontology, or an Australian hospital methicillin-resistant Staph aureus ontology, and so forth. And we need this cap capacity because Staph aureus is mutating all the time. And now there are centers for biomedical ontology. So IFAMIS was the first, but now there are uh, more of them. There are projects being funded on biomedical ontologies. 
There are journals. So there is now a journal called the Journal of Biomedical Semantics. There is a journal called Applied Ontology. There are several other ontology journals. So I'm now coming to emotions. I'm going to give you an example of how we do the emotion ontology. So we start with Buffo, and then we extend Buffo with an ontology of mental functions, mental functioning, the processes of the mind. So planning, thinking, remembering, and so forth. And then we discover that there are some mental processes which are associated with behavior-inducing states, which are states of the neu neurology part of the anatomy of an organism such as a human being. And um, so we have qualities, some of which are behavior-inducing states. We have cognitive representations, some of which are affective representations. And now we're getting close to the emotion ontology. There are mental functioning related anatomical structures such as the brain and the endocrine gland. We'll need those when we uh, work out how the emotions are connected to physiological phenomena. Uh, Brentano argued that we need to understand the expression of emotions, both the physical expression, perspiration and so forth, and also the behavioral expression, shaking your fist. But that's never going to give us a complete science of emotions. For that, we also need the subjective apprehension of emotions. So the emotion ontology deals with all of these things. It deals with occurrent emotions, a process of experiencing a feeling of hate. It, it deals with dispositions, hating someone for four years. It deals with personality traits, which a personality trait is a disposition to hate people. It's a disposition to a disposition. And then there are feelings, and this is just a small sample of the feelings in the emotion ontology, which you can find at this link including all the definitions, physiological responses associated with emotions, such as breathing at a slower rate, emotion processes such as embarrassment, compassion, shame, anxiety, anger, happiness, and so on. And then the whole is being used in studies of neurotransmitters which are involved in emotional phenomena, which are represented in the chemistry ontology that we saw earlier, and so forth. And then this is the final small section on pain. So pain is an emotion. It's a term in the emotion ontology. But there are, pain, there are pains which are what we call canonical pains. And this is the evolutionarily basic kind of pain. This is the reason why we have pain. A canonical pain is a pain which is a response to tissue damage of a precisely calibrated sort. So if you have tissue damage, you want to feel pain, but you don't want to feel too much pain because then you would be uh, dampening your pain response. But you don't want to feel too little pain because then you may ignore something which is dangerous for your survival. So you want calibrated tissue damage response, and that's what pain is in the canonical but then there are variant pains where you have discordant response, non-calibrated response, or where there is no tissue damage at all because what is damaged is, your, is the pathways which cause the pain to be experienced. And so you feel pain even though there's no tissue damage in the relevant part of your body. So canonical pain is the evolutionary basic case. Nociceptive pseudo-pain is what you have when, when your nociceptive system is, is damaged or disordered or disturbed. So neuropathic nociception. And then we also have pain-related phenomena without pain. The first of which is pain behavior without pain. 
For instance, when you go to the doctor because you, you want a, week, a week's holiday and you need a, a sick note, so you, you do pain behavior, but you don't have pain. And then tissue damage without pain, where you, have, you really ought to be feeling pain, but you, you, you're not feeling pain because you're, it's not that you have no susceptive perception, you have no, no susceptive lack of perception. And this is what the ontology branch of the emotion ontology relating to pain looks like. So we have pain, canonical pain, variant pain, and pain-related phenomena without pain, um, including lying about pain. And then canonical pain is characterized as follows, and all of this is in the emotion ontology. It involves an action tendency of withdrawal. That's why we have pain, so that we can pull our hand back from the fire. A feeling of power, powerlessness, a behavioral response such as a characteristic painful expression or wincing, and a characteristic appraisal, which we find in developed organisms, this is dangerous to me. And we can do the same thing for fear. Um, and then we, we have a question, why should we, why should we experience non-canonical fear such as Fear of seagulls, for instance. The phobia, seagull phobia. Or why do people take pleasure in watching horror films? Why do people want to experience fear? And, uh, and this is because they are somehow disturbed. <laughs> so there are... And this, is, this is in the mental disease ontology. Disorders of affect which are mental diseases which involve altered emotional functioning, not altered physiological functioning. And so we talked about that in a paper in the Journal of Biomedical Semantics. Where else? And that's the end. <laughs>